the sorry my poor end. All right, so so we continue now. We we understood that discrete time systems. Um, need a, a special treatment in order to, to describe how they operate. They operate um, or they are described by a sequence of numbers. And if the numbers follow a pattern, then the general description for the discrete time system is something called a difference equation. And we saw the analogy between the difference equation in the discrete time world and the differential equation in the um, in the continuous time domain. And in both cases, to solve them, if you remain it in the time domain, in both cases, um, it, it can be solved, but it is tedious. So we have made some, made use of some other tools in the continuous time domain. We make use of something called a Laplace transform that makes a solution um, that involves integration and differentiation um, to convert it into a domain where the solution is really multiplication and division, simple algebra. And then when you, when you get the solution there, you go to tables or from memory and you get back into time. And in the discrete time domain, um, unfortunately the Laplace transform doesn't work. It would have been nice if it did because then you didn't have to learn something else, but that there was a transform that is a relative of it, 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 it um, there's some relationship with it. And as I mentioned, um, it, it is also probably more closely re related to the uh, Fourier transform as well. And that particular transform um, is known as, as the Z transform. And that performs the work for us now um, in the discrete time domain in that difference equations we know can go to this other domain using the Z-transform where the difference equation again becomes just a simple quest, well, a question of simple algebra, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. And the function of that, of, of that particular domain is a, is a function of a variable Z. Okay, so we looked at that. We looked at some of the properties of the Z-transform. You have the slides and, and, and so on, and a lot of material on it. So, um, I didn't spend time going through all of the derivations and so on, but just to review to, to, to um, put you in, in that place. So before we get to the, the last part of the question here, they, they, we, 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 we led up to here after all of the review. So the, the question is asking now, if you have the transfer function to express it in partial fractions, and then the other one is to find the inverse as a transform here. And as I mentioned before, the, the, the partial fraction um, part uh, here, that business about partial fractions is what you have been doing with the Laplace transform and other um, mathematical topics for quite a while now, right? So it isn't anything new. The only little variable here, the only little difference is the fact that in the, Z transform, you have negative in um, negative index powers, right? You're accustomed with the Laplace transform dealing with positive indices, the Z transform, you deal with negative indices. And as I said, one way around that is to, to until we got used to it, it's not recommended, but it, it's an easy way around it, is to let another variable if you let something like a equals z to the power minus one, then you can express the, the entire um, um, equation in, form of, in the form of, of something with a positive index. Do not use, um, do not use x, y, but of course you can use z, s especially, Okay, do not use variables like that, right? So, so use variables A, B, those kind of things if you, if you need to, all right? So let's um, get to the particular, the last, um, before we, 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 we tackle this, just to finish off the, the Z transform review. And that was in uh, lecture 28. Right, so let me share lecture 28 here. Right, that would have been the very last 
lecture that we did. Let me go back here. And this lecture now gave us summary of, of, of the um, everything that we had done so far. And again, it will summarize what we did on Monday as well. Right, so the continuous time model, you remember the continuous time system takes a continuous signal in, the, 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 the system is continuous and the output is continuous. And for our purposes, remember, for at, at least at, at, at this level right now, we're dealing with linear time invariant systems, okay? If you do things like advanced controls and so on, you'll start to get into nonlinear, nonlinear, right? And instead of time, time invariant, you'll come across something called stochastic, right? Stochastic system. So you'll, you, if you're going on to postgrad or some graduate work um, here, you will meet these two terms coming in. And it, nothing to be afraid about, stochastic is, is statistics. Nonlinear means that, funnily enough, if the system, nonlinear means that, that the input output relationship, instead of doing something like this, it does something like this, right? Then what you do, typical engineering, is that if something is nonlinear, you pick a part that is approximately linear, like here. And then you apply the kind of things that we are learning in this course to a limited range. So you could predict what it's doing, and then you pick another linear part, right? You approximate it linear, and then you do the same thing. So that's the sort of approach that they take in advanced work. All right, but I was just saying, and of course the system you implement it. Remember continuous time system are all the things that you, you know about. Um, these things, remember they are real world systems. The electronics part, electronic parts of the system will be implemented using passive components and, and, and semiconductors, right? Some of the other things involved here will also be things like motors, pumps, valves, um, um, heat exchangers, those kind of things that, 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 that you'll meet in industry, boilers, believe it or not, those are all continuous time systems. They don't work with electricity, but they, um, they, they for instance, a boiler will take um, fuel, diesel, and, and heat water to make steam, but the whole process is a continuous time process, and there are models for that, okay? You've got to be using them for a long time. Right, and of course, this thing here that the input output relationship for all continuous time signals is a convolution. Right, and we know that um, the convolution now, it, this convolution, we can do it manually. And we'll, we'll do that in, in one of our sessions as well, just so we, just to make sure you have the revision done um, proper, but you can also do it using the Laplace domain and that is this multiplied by H S that the Laplace converts the convolution into a, into a multiplication process. All right, so uh, and we use this all the time when you simplify block diagrams, when you have a HS and a GS and a G1, G2 and so on, right? The discrete time system, if you think about it, um, so you have the, 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 the issue is, is that the, the real world is 99.99% continuous so that any inputs that you get from the real world is going to be a continuous time signal. If you need to, to operate on it in using a discrete time system, then we have to do use sampling and we saw about that, how, how um, what happens in sampling and, 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 and how the process works. And then you get into the discrete time system. Here is numbers, right? Numbers, numbers, okay? And once you finish and you get the, 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 the system has done its work, then you have to get back into the continuous time domain so you have to find a way of converting the numbers back into continuous time. And this is where some of the things that, that, that we met in, for instance, the electronics, the, the digital to analog conversion process takes place, right? 
here, this bit here will be the analog to digital conversion process. Okay, and we have a little um, hat here to show you that if in fact um, the real system here, whatever might have been the, the original HT, right? If you put XT into here, what you're going to get would have been, sorry, would have been YT. What we have here is an approximation to this, right? Which is why we, we, we put it, we, we put a little um, circumflex or a little heart over it. And that um, is just to indicate that, that if we, that it isn't the same thing, but if we are very careful and, and we don't make any mistakes, the difference between this and this is going to be minuscule to the extent that, that we really, it doesn't affect um, what we really trying to do, yeah? And of course, uh, of course, no, that the, the discrete time system um, invariably will be microprocessors, will be FPGAs, computers, hardware, software, um, digital logic, shift registers, counters, all right? And um, as you go back down and I have this thing that this is an estimate of what the answer should be, right? The input output relationship is again a convolution, a discrete time convolution, right? And because of the Z transform, um, that also allows us to express it in this way. Right, that if you use this air transform now, the convolution in discrete time becomes a multiplication in this domain, the Z domain. All right. And then we the discrete time system um, is described by the difference equation. And of course, we lead we you could apply the Z transform by inspection straight off. So you could do that. And then um, once it is, yeah, well, um, Basically, if you, if you have initial conditions on the input, it's causal, you could almost go straight from, from here to here by inspection, right? So in some regards, it's a lot easier than this air transform, right? Okay, and then this one was, a, was an example. So how to, if I, if I give you a different equation, what is the, 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 the transfer function of the system described by this? So the steps for this, and, and, and we, we have the answers, we, we, we did those in class already. The, the, the steps for this would be one, to, to take the Z transform, right? Two, apply the initial conditions, which are these here. Right, they give you that x n t is the unit step, so that um, x minus t, x minus two t, etc., will all be equal um, to zero. So you apply the initial conditions here. Then three, right? You have all the y z. You express the y z equal to um the x z's on that side right and then you simplify right it will have um sorry a, a, and an hz here right so they will have some components here that have y um that have y in them they will have some components here that have x in them and then they will just have some values that only have z with neither x nor y so you group them and then when you get it into this form of course, you substitute XZ, which is the Z transform of the unit step here, and you have the answer, right? We did this in class, but it's good to, to revise it again um, when, you, when you're going through and make sure that you have the, the um, that you get the answer, which we have um, in, 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 um, on the screen on top here, right? The equation can also be expressed in this form, right? And this is starting to answer the question that we have um, in front of us, the, the, the um, question 3B, you're given the upper 
transfer function and you asked her to, to express it first off in this form, is part of the answer, right? So the first thing that you have to do usually is to, if you're given that, you, you have to factorize, you have to factorize this. It's a third order equation, which means that you have three solution, three roots. Okay, if I give you this, like the question that I, um, that, 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 that is there, um, question uh, 3b, if there are three roots and I don't give you anything else, any more hints, it means, okay, you have to get some of the roots by trial and error. So the first thing you have to do is try z minus one equal to, and as I told you, if, if I give you something like this, z minus one equal is going to have either one, two, or three usually. Right, so one of those two things, one of those values there, there's six values in all, right, is a root of that equation. So once you do, once you solve, so you try a substitute. So you say, let z minus one equal to one for argument's sake. And you, you, you use the remainder theorem up here. And if the solution is zero, then that was the, the, the root of it, right? So it turns out that, that z minus one equal to one is a root, okay? So in other words, z minus one minus one, right, equal to naught, this is a factor, okay? And you could also express that, z minus one, you can also express that in this form, one minus z minus one equal to naught. This is, um, well, I'm just putting equal to naught, so you get the, 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 the answer there. Uh, but this is also a factor. So, so this and this are, are the same expression here. Okay, um, it's not, when, when you're trying to find the inverse transforms and you'll get to that, you have to get it in this form because this is how the tables are um, uh, written. If you want to factorize, it's okay to leave it in, in, um, in this form, okay? Look at the order of, of the equation here as well. Notice here, I'm starting with the constant and I'm going down here with um, increasing negative in powers here, right? Same thing here. So this is this is um, normally the, the sort of standard form that they have the transfer functions in. It doesn't have to be that way. If you look back at question 3B, you'll see that the, the order is a little bit different. All right, we'll get to that in a, in a while. And then notice this. If one minus 0.2 Z minus one is a factor, it means that the root, it was that equal to naught or Z minus one would have been equal to zero over 0.2. Zero over 0.2 is what? Zero over 0.2 is what? Come on, I know the caffeine hasn't kicked in as yet, but zero is the, what, sorry, one over 0 0.2 is what? Well. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There some silent people have to watch the other computer. Yeah, five, right? So in other words, um, if you were using this form of finding the factors, this particular factor would have been Z min minus one minus five. And this other one would have been Z minus one, what? By the same argument. Right, if I tell you one plus 0.1 Z minus one, z to the minus one is a factor. It means that the root is that, in other words, z minus minus one is equal to minus 10, or the factor is z minus one plus, um, sorry, is equal, yeah, is, is equal to minus 10. So in other words, z plus 10 
is a factor for that one, right? Yeah. So same those those sort of manipulations. As I said, if you if you're having issues with that, you can always always express this as 1.4 minus 0.6 a plus 0.2 a squared and so on. All right, just until um, you get the hang, hang of it, right? But z minus one is the is the sort of unit that they're dealing with there, right? Um, we could, and of course, we could also always rationalize the express in positive in the indices. So you multiply by by the, if for instance, if I wanted to convert, um, let me just get a different uh, color here. If I wanted to convert the upper one by into positive in indices, right? I can multiply this by z cubed over z cubed. You look at whatever the highest negative index here, and that will be the, the, the highest um, either here or, or, or um, on, on the numerator. And the opposite, the, the positive version of that would be the, the, the um the uh, value that you're going to have to multiply by, right? So you can convert that in, into positive um, powers of Z, right? This is the one, um, okay, just on half a second. Yes, this particular version is the one where you would, if, if there was a question somewhere to ask you about the regions of convergence, right? So, so this would have been the, the sort of version of, of that, that, that that would be used for, for a question like that. Um, you can also get poles and zeros. So if you um, find the roots now, well, you have the poles here, the zeros, the poles are here. The zeros will be, of course, the roots of the um, the, the, the numerator, right? Um, so, in in other words, uh, the, the the idea behind this is that all of these are describing the same system. So, the discrete time system you could describe it by a different a difference equation. You could describe it by a transfer function. You could describe it in terms of the poles and zeros, right? They, 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 this is how it is implemented, right? So this is actually how um, it is implemented in reality, okay? And when we were doing the, the, the diagrams for it and, and, and so on, um, we just mentioned it a little bit, but, but uh, if you ever do um, a course like um, discrete signal processing and so on, You'll see how we actually do that. This this is how you would put it into the the FPGAs or the the, the microprocessors and so on, All right? This is how you look at the transfer function to, to um, basically to, to to see to to check for um, the the order of the transfer function, uh, the, the sort of information that you're getting from from these two. One, this tells you where the poles and zeros are. You remember that for, for the transfer function to be stable, the poles have to be inside of the unit circle, all right? So this version will give you that. This tells you where the zeros are located. Um, this version right now is not particularly useful for you here, but this is the version that you'll use to get the frequency response of it. You will substitute, um, just like how you substitute S equal to J omega in the Laplace domain, there's a substitution that you do here to get the frequency response of it. So all of them have their uses, right? So then the other part now is that, okay, so great. You have a transfer function here. How do I find what the output sequence? In other words, how do I solve a transfer function, which is like what we did with a continuous time domain. If I give you um, H S equals something or Y S equals something, Right? Remember, we go into this domain because the manipulations are easy. We could see a lot of um, properties and behaviors here, but eventually we have to come back to the real world. Right? In other words, take an inverse transform to get back into time. So what is, how do we get the inverse transform of this? And in the case of the Z transform, there are three ways you can do it. 
One is by long division. So this one now, it gives you um, an answer that basically gives you what the first few terms of the answer looks like. So for instance, if I have the, the, the um, transfer function, step one is that you must put it in this form, right? So you must start with the, with the constant and then go down in either decreasing powers of Z or increasing negative powers, however you want to, 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 to um, look at it. In other words, in plain English, this number is supposed to be getting bigger as you're going this way, right? Bigger and more negative in that direction, okay? So make sure you sort it out first. And then you divide the numerator by the denominator. Long division, but you have to have it in, in, in this form, right? And then um, I think there's some examples coming on, so I'll, I'll hold on for a little bit. But once you get it now, after you divide it and you get the first few terms, right? In this case, we got the first three terms. If I tell you why z is equal to that, then y and t straight off from that is 1.4, 0.94, 1.4, 1.4. Right? So you get the immediate, as soon as you get it into this form, by inspection, you have the inverse transform here, right? This is the Y naught, right? Because this is Z to the power naught here. This is Y one, because this is Z to the power minus one, right? Z to the power minus two, we means that this would be um, uh, Y, uh, two here, and so you go on. So if if we didn't, for instance, if this was, if it was, went from z to the minus one, and the next answer here was z to the minus three, then the an answer here instead would have been 1.4, 0 0.94, 0, and 1.12, okay? You can't keep going on and on like that because it, this will just keep giving you values. It, it will never end. But this is useful. Um, this is useful for when you're checking how the system works. So if this is a transfer function, remember all of these things uh, as uh, as we indicated before. All of these things are ways you're not doing it because you like the math. I mean, I, I, that might be part of the reason. But you're doing this because this is supposed to describe a real world discrete time system. And if something happens to it, you want to figure out, well, when I turn this thing on, what are the first few, you remember it's numbers is generating. What are the first few values that is going to generate? Okay, so let's say this is working on a five, this is an FPG and it's working on 3.3 on volts power supply. The first set of numbers that it generates, of course, can't be greater than that, All right? By the time you convert it, um, you pass it through the digital to analog converter, the answer obviously can't be greater than that because if the power supply is 3.3, then it's not going to work. So this will tell you, okay, the first value output might be 1.4 volts and 0.094 volts, and then here 1.12 volts. So that, that is okay, all right? That's all you want to, to, to do from um, using a long division technique. It's, it's just a, a, a very quick rough and ready. We, of getting what the first few values are of the, um, the response might look like. Make sense? Yeah? No, maybe? Yeah. And here it is, the, um, it gives the first, um, the, the, the sequence of values which, he, which led to the transfer function. And just, just out of curiosity, if the sequence does not end, we call it an infinite response. And if the sequence ends or comes to some small value after um, a number, of, uh, a finite number, then we call it a finite response. All right? Infinite, uh, these depend on how the system, because if it's generating um, a set of numbers, and infinite is relative, okay? Um, for computer systems, infinite may be 
how many numbers it takes to fill up the memory. Uh, a, a laptop or, 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 or something or a tablet might have, you know, gigabytes of memory. But if you're thinking about something like a, like a medical device, for instance, a medical device might have a memory that may be, you, you know, a, a few kilobytes at most. So that an infinite response will be something that generates enough values to, 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 to fill up a, a, a few um, hundred bytes or a few kilobytes of memory. So it, 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 it is all relative to the, the application. But usually an infinite response means that the system will just keep generating numbers. Once you put an input, it's going to keep generating answers coming out, which is not necessarily the best thing. A lot of times well, what you would prefer is a finite response. So it generates a set of numbers, right? So it generates a set of numbers, um, negative, positive, and then after you know a few of them, it just dies down, right? And it stops. So after that, so after some n, right? Some some um, n which is finite, right? It stops. So at that point, you know that that you wouldn't run out of memory space and that kind of thing. And these are the ones that you you try to get so that you can program it into a computer easily. All right, that is part of our, um, another course, but just keep it in mind. Every time you all sit down with, um, you use um, picks, you use Raspberry Pis, um, you use Arduinos, you use uh, a bunch of other devices and so on. All of them have limited memory on board. And uh, depending on the sort of application that you have and how you have to program it, you have to be careful if, if what you're doing is going to generate a never ending set of numbers for the for, for, for the um, little device to hand, all right. The second way, of course, you could find is a trans the inverse transform is, is mathematically, which is um, to use something called complex contour integration, and um, and some complex numbers theories uh, to do it, and um, it actually is one of the ways that they, they also uh, find the inverse transform, the inverse Laplace transform. And in fact, if you look at, 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 at um, if you Google like, like tables of Laplace transforms and Z transforms, you see some extremely complicated uh, um, uh, expressions that they found the inverse transform, inverse transforms for. And those were done using um, integration. All right, uh, we will avoid that because our approach is to get it into a form. Um, this is nice and it works mathematically and, and, and somebody did it for us, so we have them in table form. So our approach instead is to, to, um, to use the, the, the Laplace transform approach and the other transform techniques approach, which is to get the thing into a form where we could go into our lookup table and get the answer. And that form means taking the transfer function and breaking it up into smaller bits. And the smaller bits are what we look up in the table for. Those smaller bits are, of course, what we call partial fractions. So you take the, 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 the transfer function, you, se you separate it into partial fractions, which are smaller um, components that together make up the transfer function. And then you go to your table and you find the index. Right. This gives you, as opposed to the this one, where the long division, where you're getting just the first few values, this one, this version gives me what is called a closed form version of the answer. Right. In other words, this is going to give me y and t in terms of um, something where I could sub uh, an answer, which is a, a, a function, a function of t. So if I want to find out what um, y um, less than 75 t looks like, I just substitute my the number 75 um, in the answer. And I will get that. So this is why you call it a closed form solution. You could you can now use it to, to verify any to, to calculate any answer going forward. 
right? To do this, of course, the, in the, the, the transform must be proper, which is the point that I was making um, when, when, when you're doing, let me just go back here. I made that point, um, right. If you, if you look at this and you want to, let me just get rid of some. that right here, right? If you want to work in positive indices here, and I were to multiply this by um, Z cubed over Z cubed, right? What I'm going to get in my answer, notice is that the first term here, if I multiply this in positive indices, I'm going to get 1.4 Z cubed, and I'm going to have a Z cubed here. The next term is going to be minus 0 0.6 z squared, right, uh, minus 1.1 z squared, um, so on. But notice what happens when you, when you convert it to positive indices here. The order of the numerator and the denominator are the same. And that is our no-no when you're trying to get the partial fraction form. The equation must be proper. In other words, the order of the numerator must be less than the, um, the order of the denominator. If they are equal, then you're going to have to divide at least once, okay? To satisfy, um, I mean, so if this is Z, if this is Z, like we had, if it's Z cubed and Z cubed, you're going to have to divide this at least once, so you'll get one plus, um, or some constant plus Z squared over the Z cubed bit, all right? And of course, if it's Z, something like Z fourth, then you're going to have to divide this at least twice. So you're going to get a, um, a LZ at least plus a K plus something, right? Which is why um, I always, I'm recommending always that you keep it in the negative um, index form, yeah? Some math books tell you to do it in a positive index form, but then you have to do a thing at the end to, um, to, to, to account for, for um, these constants here. I don't like that. And it just makes it um, unnecessarily complicated, right? So be careful if you're using a math book um, uh, uh, for, for extra reading or anything like, like that for the Z transform, that it, they, they invariably use positive in the indices and they, there are some other steps that have to be done. Okay? All right, so remember that. So once you do it now, um, they, they, to, to get the partial fractions, of course, treat Z minus one as a variable, right? So this is your A, right? So this is one minus A, this is one minus 0.2A, and this is one plus 0.1A. If you not comfortable with a negative in index, so this is going to be simple roots. So you, you get them. It's going to be a a over the first factor, a b over the second factor, and a c over the second, the third factor, and you solve for a, b, and c, um, like you are accustomed doing. All right. Uh, of course, if you're using little a down here, probably don't use capital a on top. All right, they wouldn't want something like that. This is why I say it tends to get a little bit messy, but use a variable if you have to. Use something, if you're using A, B, and C on top here, then, then maybe use M uh, down here or something of the like, right? And then at the end, remember to convert it back, please. Right, so you express the partial fractions and then you solve for A, B, and C like you are accustomed doing. You either do it by the, the sort of what we call the, the sort of cover-up method, or you could get three simultaneous equations and solve for A, B, and C. Whatever is your custom and comfortable doing and that you have been doing, apply to this. Just remember that Z minus one is the, um, is the variable. Okay, and everything else will work good. So once you get it into the, the close, the, the partial fraction form, you go to the tables. The Z transform tables, always have the, the, the transforms 
um, the uh, numer sorry the de the de de, um, denominators expressed as one plus something, right? So if you are if you were working like we had early on, um, you had let, let's say you were solving the roots and and you had z minus one uh, as your partial fractions. Um, uh, this would have been z uh, what was it minus five. And I think Z plus 10. All right. You would get your answer now. So you're going to get your answer. Right? You're going to get your answer, but you're going to have to convert it back from this to this is um, really five into one minus point two Z minus one. All right. So you're going to have to, um, to, to, to get it back into that form, right? Into this form, okay? And then once you do that, you go and check your, your, your tables here, right? And then you write out the answer. And this is what I mean by the closed form solution. So here now, if I want to get Y25, right? I just substitute N equal to 25 here. 25 uh, and 25 here and see what happens, right? So I could get y, y25 and, uh, and so on. This answer, of course, this is a closed form solution. And this was the, if you go back here, this was the solution that we got using the long division. So for instance, here, this is y naught, right? A check of it. So we know y naught is 1.4. If I go back here and I substitute y naught, so I want to get y naught now. So y naught will be equal to, um, this is one, so this is 1.136 minus, if this is naught, this is 0 0.567. And if this is naught, it means this to the power naught is one plus 0 0.83, right? And if you work out that, you're supposed to get, and I forgot what the answer was. What was the answer? You're supposed to get 1.4? 1.4, right? Right? So if you add these up, you're supposed to get 1.4 here. Right? So this together is supposed to give me 1.4. Right? You can check it. And if it's not 1.4, don't let me know. All right? So that's a closed form solution. And that was that was it for the um, the material that we had to, to do. All right? So let's go back to the um, the question paper now. So we know in our position to tackle the paper. Right? So, right, so again, so, so here's, here, here's the, the form. Notice the, the form of the, um, what do you call it? Of the problem here. Let me just clear clear away some of that a little bit, right? So, okay. I think this was saved from last time, so I'll, I'll. So it's part of the part of the. It's not part of the this slide, so I'll erase it later. Right. So, if you're given this now, your, um, what shall I say? Your approach for this is now to, as I told you all, okay, so this is Z cube and I haven't given you any, any other hint. So you're now going to have to try Z minus one equal to plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, right? And see what happens, right? If you look at Z minus one, Z minus one equal to one, just for argument's sake, try that in here. That will give you one plus three minus one minus three. 
which is zero. So first off, z minus one minus one is one of the roots. Okay. So the next step is to do what? How do I get the the the, the other roots of this? How do I get the other roots? I know that this is one of them. So how am I going to get, it's, it's an order three here, so I need to have two other roots here. How do I get that? No, not substitute. Substitute is not going to help you. What you're going to have to do now is to do a little bit of division. So if this is a root, the other roots, you have to factor out this one. So somewhere along the place, let me just, this one I think I could erase this. So, so we have Z, Z minus three plus three Z minus two minus Z minus one minus three. If we have one of the roots is Z minus one, what was it? Minus one. Right? So you now have to divide to find the other, the other two inside of here. All right? So you divide. So if I divide this, I'm going to multiply this by Z minus two, and I said Z minus three minus Z minus two here. This takeaway that is going to give me four Z minus two minus Z minus one plus Four Z minus one, four Z minus two, minus four Z minus one. Take it away, right? And you're going to get um uh this take away that you're going to get three Z minus one minus three and plus three. You get three Z minus one minus three, right? So that the the other factor in this. So this is now Z minus one minus one into Z squared plus four Z minus one plus three. And you could recognize by inspection now that this bit here is Z plus three, right? Into Z minus one plus one. So those are the three factors here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Make sense? So, I'm yes. Not too sure, yes. Uh, but um, the second line you have, well, no, no, the first line that you have, Z to the power of negative one minus one, close brackets, close brackets, Z to the power squared, right? I think that's supposed to be negative two. Uh, plus four Z minus the Z plus four Z minus to the power minus one plus three. I think it's supposed to be a Z to the power minus two. So we divide it in the long division, we get the um, Z minus two. Uh, don't know, don't know. Here? Okay, we start off here. Guide me from here. Is it here you're talking about? Right, so the answer that you get there, right, was z to the power of negative two plus four z to the power of negative one plus three, right? Right, yeah, yeah. Right, and then that, that'll be the, the next one where you have to, um, where you have to simplify, right? So you That's need a factor, to find... right, is that, right? Which is, right. Yeah. right, good, but where you have the arrow going to there, you have z to the power of squared. Right, right, right. Yeah. 
Good, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, nice. All right? And then you factorize yeah. it. So what's the next step now? If you have it here, you know what the question is asking for partial fractions now. So so since you have a three a is equals to z to the power of minus one, a is equals to um well that'll be one, negative three, and negative and negative one. Right. So you you the the, the, the partial fraction form right is going to be a over z minus one minus one plus b over z minus one plus three plus c over z minus one plus um, one, right? And then you yeah. solve for a, b, and c, as you were saying. Yeah. Right? And then once you get that, that, that that's the answer. Right. So, so we have that here. Notice that I didn't I didn't mention anything about the, the standard um, form of this thing, right? If you have to do like in, in, in this particular one here, which is already sorted in the correct form, if this, if I had asked you to find H and T here for me, right? Then what you're going to have to do is to get this actually into a different form. You remember this is, uh, when you get it here, you actually have to express it into the form one plus or minus a z minus one. All of them you're going to have to convert into that form. Or, or you reorder this. You, you reorder this into the descending um, form like this, right? So, so you put this the other way wrong. So this would have been four plus two z minus one plus z minus three over minus three minus z minus one plus three z minus two um, plus z minus three. Okay? That would give you the, 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 the form to get the inverse transform. The transfer form, the, the partial fractions doesn't matter, right? And if you did it at this form, if, if you did it like this, right? That answer is correct as far as the, 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 the question paper is concerned. If you, if you went ahead and you actually, before you did the partial fractions, you converted this to the standard form and then found the answers. I am happy with that. You will, um, both versions I'll give you the marks for, okay? Okay, um, so what about this, right? What about if you plug in um, like z to the power minus three plus um, three z to the power of minus two, if you plug in that into the calculator, right? And you get the three, you get the three numbers that it's supposed to be, and then you just solve where well, you have to show the long division to get the marks. Yeah, I would prefer because um, I know some, yeah, some calculators will solve the roots and so on for you. The issue is that if you make a mistake and you enter the wrong thing, and you just give me the answers for A, B, and C, and um, the answers are incorrect because you made a mistake and you have no working, then all I will be able to do, usually for something like this, is eight marks, right? So typically for this, you're getting two for each of these and two for the, 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 the one way of right, getting the, the factorizing and that kind of thing. If you oh, went from, okay. from, from point A way straight to the answer, the answer is wrong, then I don't have any way to give you marks inside. Okay, okay. All right? yeah, no the calculators are a good way to verify your answer after you do it, if you have time. Okay? And I know the calculators here yeah, could, could, could do all of these things. And, and I guess if, if I am sure that everybody had the same kind of calculators coming in or in time to come, if I was able to get people to use MATLAB in the exam and that kind of thing, then I could, I could put all kind of things here because I know it, it, you're not doing it by hand. All right, but just um, just just the, the more working you have is is it's it's insurance for you that if something went wrong that I have a a, a place to allocate some marks to, to to give you a chance. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, so that's it for today. The next um on Friday we will um do the 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 piecewise continuous signals, and then we will talk about the route with stability criteria in review. We did it once already, we'll go over it here again. All right, and then um, 
So that will more or less revise the course and then the next um, period going forward will be um, really you doing the questions and, 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 and me seeing where you got stuck and so on. All right, so any other questions um, right now? Okay, no. All right. Um, it's a quick review because we've done it before. So, so um, if when you're going over the slides uh, and then the, the thing about the recordings that we did before, you could always kind of fast forward into a particular area. You don't have to listen to the whole um, one hour or whatever it is kind, kind of thing. Um, but if at, in, in there um, something doesn't make sense or something is a little bit inconsistent with what I've been saying, let me know. Okay, and we'll try to clarify it up. That's what this session, the, these um, sessions are about. All right. Okay, so if that's the case, I will uh, 